Welcome everyone, it's Ken Bergen here from SilverChef and our webinar is about to start. So uh, we've got a really good roll up today. It's the topic of the moment, isn't it? Uh, this one about recruitment and retention. Got uh, some terrific uh, experts here to talk with you today. James Dillamore, who's a recruiter. Paul Rifkin, who's a uh, chef and consultant, a lot of experience behind him, and my colleague Nikki Smith from Silver Chef also. She does a lot of uh, travelling around the countryside and gets to see kind of from the inside uh, who's working well with recruitment and happy with staffing and others who are less successful. So I'm sure we'll have some great ideas to share with you. And if you wouldn't mind uh, just telling me how my sound is, say hello and uh, just drop your in. If you see the chat there, um, if you just uh, give me some feedback. How's the sound? Thanks, Dylan. Great. Hey, Kathy. <clears throat> Thank you, Elton. Peter. Nice. Okay. <clears throat> All right, folks, so one thing to do is on that little chat box, see down the bottom is a little blue strip. If you just change that so it says panellists and attendees, that way everyone will see um, any comments that you put in there. And that's where you'll be putting uh, questions as well. So we're going to start the webinar now and we will be recording it and you'll all be, everyone will be sent a recording um, straight afterwards. Okay. Welcome everyone, it's Ken Bergen here from Silver Chef and great to have you here for the staff recruitment and retention webinar today. Um, we're all about finding solutions and uh, it really is a huge issue. Um, there's never been a time when I haven't heard um, restaurant operators and owners and managers uh, having a, a bit of a grizzle about the shortage of staff or you can't, can't find people. I sometimes wonder what exactly they're looking for, but it's there's one thing for sure in the last 18 months, uh, you know, with the closing of the doors for immigration and um, a lot of people lost their jobs and a lot of people decided not to come back to hospitality. So we've got a real uh, recruitment issue on our hands. Uh, nevertheless, there's still some positive ways you can stand out above your competitors and your colleagues in your town, your street, and we want to show you how that is. So let me just go through a few details to start with. Um, if you want to ask questions and share the chat, you see the chat box there. And um, yeah, drop your questions in. We've got the experts here and we'll make sure that we answer all the questions as we go through. We'll definitely answer them as we go along. If there's any we need to um, leave to the end, we will do that. Generally, we try and handle them straight away. And if there's um, a curly one, we'll um, take that offline and handle it later on as well. And you can see where you can uh, adjust your sound. Most people are pretty familiar with Zoom after the last 18 months um, working out of offices and things. So, um, yeah, it's not so hard. Um, just a reminder, take notes. You know, ideas fly in one ear and out the other. Scribble it down on a pad and write it on your hand. Or, um, yeah, I'd use your note app on your phone. That's my preference so that it's not forgotten. Uh, we'll be dropping links into the chat for you to click on, different resources um, and uh, how you can contact uh, Paul and James. Um, as I mentioned before, if you could set your chat so that everyone can uh, see it, so the little blue bar, make that um, all panellists and attendees. And we've got a poll that we're going to do in a minute, just uh, three simple questions. It's useful to get your feedback on some of the issues uh, and it might raise some discussion points as well. Uh, disclaimer, important disclaimer about uh, what you hear and understand from the webinar today. <clears throat> we'll do our best. Ultimately, responsibility is yours, how you use that information. And uh, our next webinar coming up in a month's time is about creating a more profitable coffee business. So a bit of a change of gears. It still needs staff to do it well, though, and we will be uh, mentioning that in passing also. So introduce our guests today, Paul Rifkin, a consultant chef. I've known Paul for, gosh, I don't know, about 15 years or so. <laughs> bit of a larrikin in a good way and a huge amount of experience and um, a big heart too. You know, I've really... Uh, 
kind of watched the way Paul's uh, trained and developed, you know, hundreds of people really over the years. And um, he certainly knows a lot about uh, how to uh, retain and uh, recruit people. James Dillamore, um, very successful and experienced recruiter. Um, hospitality is his game. And, uh, yeah, he sort of knows the market extremely well and he's going to be giving us some great insights. And my colleague, Nikki Smith, who's uh, one of our business development managers at Silver Chef, she travels around the countryside a fair bit talking to smaller operators, cafes, restaurants, pubs, and she's got some, uh, yeah, pretty accurate insights, I think, into what kind of works um, with successful businesses and staffing is a key part of that. My background, restaurants and cafes in Sydney, um, quite a few years. That's a, a while back. I've been working with Silver Chef for the last five years. Before that, I had my own consulting business. So let's get into uh, the details now, folks. And uh, we're, one of the main things we're going to talk about and show you some better ways to work is... Um, about writing better advertisements. And uh, if you look at that list of words there against the bullet points, you'll see um, what I guess about 90% of ads uh, that I see, that it seems like that's all that people put down. It's like a list of demands. You must do this. You must be this. You must be that. And, um, you know, we all listen to radio, what's in it for me. And I don't know that a lot of those words really resonate with a lot of people. Um, James, any comments on uh, the ads that you see, the, the ads that don't work? Yeah, very, very similar. Um, I think that um, a lot of advertising seems to be um, seems to be thrown together, and as you said, list of demands rather than you know an invitation, which is I think how an advert, advert should read. Um, so yeah, I suppose not particularly engaging is probably the best way to describe a lot yeah. of advertising you see. <laughs> I, I rushed through without doing uh, you know, going into the, the detailed introduction. So do you want to just tell us a bit about, you know, your background, um, the last few years, you know, the detailed work that you've been doing with hospitality and what, what's, what's working in the market now? Yeah, sure, no worries. So um, I spent about 20 odd years in hospitality operations before going into um, hospitality recruitment around seven years ago. I set up my own business. Um, I've seen massive changes in the market over the last seven years. Um, uh, I think the advent of, you know, systems, IT systems and AI has been massive. Um, so it's much easier to, I guess, headhunt and for want a better, of a better expression, po poach talent from places you want to find it. It's, what, it's way easier to do that now. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, obviously the change in the market in terms of the quantity of, of candidates has, has been massively impacted by um, by what, what's happened over the last um, 18 months. Um, obviously, a lot of people have gone home. Um, a lot of people were left out in the cold and didn't have any work, so they've got out of HOSPO and, and you know, found jobs with other businesses and other sectors and have decided to stay there. Um, so it's, it's just like the perfect storm of, 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 you know, a lack of talent and no new real talent coming into the market, which is creating, I mm. guess, the, the issues that people are seeing at the moment. Mm. Hey, Paul, what's your reaction to our list of uh, our demanding list there? And tell us a bit about your uh, background. I, I gave you a wrap, but you give yourself a wrap. Tell us what the sort of work you're doing at the minute too. Yeah, look, the, the list of demands. I mean, I saw a, a Facebook ad today for a chef and it was, it was more an insult and telling everybody, you know, if you can't cut tomatoes, don't apply. If you can't do this, don't do this. If you can't do that, you know, I'm sick of being used by people. And I was, I was thinking, is this an, is this an advert? Do they actually want anybody to apply? Or, is this a joke or, or a joke? Or are, they, <laughs> or are they just, they just out there to insult every possible person that's looking yeah. for a job? Um, look, they may get someone I don't know, but yeah, it's, it's, it's so important not to, not to have too much negative language out there for it. Mm. And look, I've, I've been in hospitality as a chef for over forty years. And for over 30 years of that, I was an executive chef working in big places, big clubs. And three years ago, I started out my own consultancy, Chef Paul Rifkin Consulting. And I work with clubs, pubs, any organisation pretty much, and mentor executive chefs on how to, how to build their team better, how to get better retention, how to improve profitability, 
and improve the, their offering basically. So it's more what the customer wants rather than what the chef wants. And so when you say mentor executive chefs around their recruitment, what are some of the things you need to get them doing more of? Well, first off, it's like how, how do they look after their people that they've got employed already? So are there issues with the way that they're talking to uh, people? Because I go in there and I do like a three-day audit on it's more like a colonoscopy, like I'm there and I see a lot of stuff. <laughs> so there's nothing that can be hidden. I find all the good stuff and the bad stuff. And and you watch and observe behaviours. You know, over a few days, people's guards drop a little bit. Uh-huh. And that way you can see the way they're actually treating staff, whether they're barking orders or whether they're encouraging people who are, you know, not quite up to speed. Or, you know, how do they deal with a service that's gone awry? Yeah. Do they, do they mm-hmm. beat them up or do they pull them aside and, and point out the little things that need improvement? And, and it's also the same with bosses. You know, does the boss walk into the kitchen and start berating the executive chef or head chef or lead chef in front of the team? And, you know, that whole thing is just uncomfortable. And so that's what I identify and then put strategies in place mm. to reverse that a little bit. Because if you can retain it, as, as James will say, if you can retain it, people won't actually leave. Even, yeah. though, even though poaching is a big thing, uh, if, people don't, if people are comfortable where they are, but they just won't leave. Mm. And, and I know that because I, I had an extremely low hash rate when I was at Campbelltown Catholic Club. And many chefs came, stayed as apprentices and ended up being head chefs in restaurants that I had. Mm-hmm. So, you know, 15, 16 year tenures. Um, mm. Um, what I, do you uh, notice, Nikki, when you're talking to smaller operators in your travels? What, what are they, the ones who seem to be satisfied with their staff and, you know, don't complain maybe? What, what are some of their qualities? Um, they just seem to be happier and more flexible. So it's not as I, I grew up or grew up, I worked in clubs in my 20s. Um, and so there was the culture over 20 years ago, God, I'm giving my age away now, was very much what Paul was saying was we're trying to avoid now. Um, and you still do see it in some places where it's you, it's got to be this way, it's got to be right now, and the chef will, will yell. And you even see in comedy acts how they talk, you know, a chef, you've never heard a chef do this, and, yeah. Um, but I find when I'm out uh, if the owner, because there's a lot of owner managers where where I go mm-hmm. in regional areas, it's a lot smaller, the owners, often the chef as well. But they just seem to be having more of a laugh and working together. And it's like a family. Mm-hmm. And because of that, the quality of the food that goes out is so much better um, because everyone is invested it's not I'm just doing this for a wage. It's I'm doing this for my friends. Mm, um, interesting. Yeah. 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 Nice. Okay. Well, look, I've got a couple of examples <clears throat> of ads. I took kind of bad ads and did a little bit of rewriting for them. The one uh, from Cafe Zero is a country, a rural uh, location, and the one from uh Cafe Tropo is a city. So just um, kind of curious, um, Paul and James, any kind of feedback on those? Anything you would add to, you know, improve the ads or something like that? The first thing that jumps out as me is uh, modern kitchen. There's nothing worse than a chef having to work in a kitchen where the oven door is kept up by a little hook that they've got to throw over. Uh-huh. Or, you know, there's a six burner stove but only three burners work. Or, you know, the other two are intermittent. Uh, so you're always chasing yourself fryers that don't work correctly. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, you know, modern kitchen, happy team, free parking. You know, if if that's in a place where parking is hard to get, that's that's an absolute win. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, any of those? Uh, any, would you add any other words, uh, James? Or uh... <clears throat> I, I think for an ad, for an ad that size, um, you know, there's only so much information you can put in there, but. Um, I think the key words are, are, are really good. Um, I, I think if there was a bit more space, um, you know, I, I definitely start to add 
some other sections around, you know, the role or the culture in the business or, you know, the benefits of working there. But I think if you're if you're looking at a, a snapshot, um, you know, that's that's pretty that's pretty good. It's yeah. Pretty key points. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'm I'm old enough to uh, remember advertising in uh, well Sydney Morning Herald for me when it was you know you paid by the word and you're very frugal with the size of the ad. Now you can right away. You know you don't need to be kind of short and um, tight like this. So yeah, t- point taken. You know that, let's let's not don't fill it up with hype. But all right. So we put together. I asked um, James and. Paul for some feedback on you know what uh, yeah what made success for recruitment and they gave me a list and I added some of my things and we put um, a big fat list together of the benefits that you may want to use whether it's in an ad or in a conversation uh, it might be on the in, you know the workplace uh, web page on your website. Um, Paul, with your work, what are some of the priority um, pointers that you would include from this list? Well, de- definitely the, the the flexi roster, which was on the other one, and also I've written down two weekends off per month. Uh, at, at the moment, people have had a lot of time off over the last 12 months in, in various forms, certainly in the three-month lockdown and you know places like Melbourne had a lot more and the intermittent nature of all the different lockdowns they've had. Mm-hmm. But, but one thing that's come out of it is that the majority have found that they've got a, that they've, they've enjoyed their family life a lot more. They've been introduced to family they may not have seen, you know, for 10 years or, or whatever. I certainly know what that feels like. Who and, is that young person? <laughs> absolutely. And so it's, it's very important now that it, it, all of a sudden work is not number one. Uh, you know, priorities have been have been modified, and family has now become more of number one, and then work is sort of down the line a little bit, and so it's very important that you that that a business is able to be flexible, and and deal with that because staff will go home if children are sick. You know, once upon a time they'd you know sort of work out who's going to do what or try and work out things, but now I'm seeing a lot more that the staff just simply go. And if you are not providing that flexibility for weekends so they can go to footy and things like that, you know, intermittently, admittedly, you know, that businesses are still got to run, but if you're not letting them come in later on a Saturday or, or the, just giving them options to, to be flexible, then that, that's going to make it hard. Mm, interesting, yeah. Um, James, what's uh, some of your observations here um, I think we um, potentially touched on it um, a little earlier but I think sponsorships are a key one um, at the moment there's obviously really limited talent available and a lot of the talent that is available is is sponsored uh, and a lot of the talent within the cities um, that is sponsored you know has a pathway to permanent residency if they go to regional areas so particularly if you're in a regional area if you are set up as a sponsoring business um, I'd recommend um, listing that as a key benefit on the job ad Mm -hmm. Um, and what you might find is that you'll find someone on a graduate visa who can start straight away um, who's looking for a pathway to PR that needs regional sponsorship um, and you'll actually attract some really good people that way um, it, it is worth a graduate what in a, in a hospitality degree or a, just any sort of degree yeah so um, you have um, any any sort of degree you know people come over to Australia to study and they tend to work in hospitality to support that study and while they're working in hospitality quite often they'll complete diplomas and cert fours um, and once you've got enough relevant experience and those qualifications you actually have a pathway to permanent residency if you work regionally for a period of time um, so you know and it doesn't necessarily that's, that's one example of sponsorship but if you are set up as a sponsoring business I, I would at the moment absolutely put it on the ad because it, it can actually it can actually entice you know I, I suppose for me at the end of the day when I'm writing an ad I'm trying to I'm trying to appeal to as many people as possible you know as many as many parts of the market as possible um, and I might get some really good applications maybe not they're not quite right for that role but they might be right for another one Mm-hmm. Um, but what you're really trying to do is get as many clicks and, and, and conversations started as possible. Um, so I think that's just a really good avenue 
um, just just to get some more interest. Mm. Um, so Sarah's made an interesting point there uh, in the in the chat. So sponsorship's great if it visas a protest, but four of her team members that haven't been processed for eighteen months, and we hear lots of stories about um, home affairs, whatever it is, home affairs. I think isn't it who. Mm. Um, are just not handling their responsibilities, it seems. Have you guys got any feedback on that? Well, I mean, I, I, I've, I, have, I placed a chef three weeks ago and his visa is going to be approved next week. So I'm not sure um, what, okay. what, what's going on in that situation. I know it has been slower, um, but they are, they are going through. Um, it, but it is taking a bit longer. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> Culture is one of the, of the words on the last bullet point, James. What's you're quite uh, clear that that's an important part of promoting a job. Well, what's what the C word? We're not talking about um, movies and uh, music here, are we? What, what are we talking no. about? <laughs> so it's about it's about the values, you know, either as of your organisation or if, you, if you're a small business, it, it, as you as an employer. Um, so what what's important to you from you know, a personality and behavior perspective and a, a good way to, you know, describe values, what you value is behaviors. So, you know, whether it's a, a supporting culture, whether it's, you know, open, whether it's, um, you know, strong communication, you know, ambitious, whatever those words are, it's really important to, um, to, to use those words and also put them into context and into the context of the behaviors you want to see. Um, and in my experience, if you do that well, um, you will um, resonate with candidates who, um, you know, who think the same way as you. And that's where, um, I mean, advertising is just one small part of recruitment. Like that's probably forms about 20% of the placements I make actually come from advertising. Um, so just like to make that that clear. But mm, I think interesting. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that um, I think that. Um, having values and behaviors on advertising is super important because yeah, you, you're speaking to your target audience when you use that language. Well, what's a, have you had any recent examples of where you've kind of been speaking clearly about culture and that's got a response? Yeah. So, I mean, I put, I put, I mean, part of the brief I take from my clients when I, when I, I guess start an engagement with them is, is understanding them, their values and how their business operates, how they make decisions. Um, and I'll write about that in the advertising. So most of the advertising I will put up um, will will have a, a section on culture and values. Um, but um, yeah, I made a, um, we're made, making a placement at the moment for a, a high-end French restaurant. Um, and they were very um, specific about their values and their culture um, being, you know, they wanted someone humble, honest. Um, it's a very high performing business. They're going for chef's hats. Um, so we, we really kind of drilled down into that on the advertising and all the reach out to the candidates in the database and um, ended up getting a really solid response. Um, I'm curious about the word humble. It's uh, not one I would normally have sort of associated with restaurant, busy restaurants. Not a chef anyway. No. <laughs> well, I, th I, th I think it's humble. Like, I, I don't know. I disagree with that. You, you know, you, you do come across chefs who, who, who are, who are not all about, you know, stamping their feet and, you know, who are more humble and relaxed. And, okay. And, and that's what they're looking for in their kitchen. Like they, they want that yeah. nurturing personality. And, and that's why it's so important to have that in the advert. Uh -huh. because I like the description, the if, way you've if described If I sent them yeah. a Gordon Ramsay pan thrower, that wouldn't have gone down, you know. Um, mm. and, and it's a new opening. And, and as Paul, or well, all of you know, like you've got, you've got one chance to make a first impression. You've got to get it right. Um and that's why having that in there was so important. And, and I think that's why we we found the right person is because we really, really zeroed in on, on that mm. particular trait, mm. um, because that's how the executive chef is. He doesn't want someone who's not like him. So um, that, that's, that's why I suppose that's why we do it. Yeah, nice. Um, one of the, sorry, yeah, Nikki, oh, I was on. just going to say one of the things on the list that's there is staff meals. I'm really surprised when I see in a lot of the Facebook forums people that ask, should I charge my staff for the meals? And I just personally feel that that's so wrong on so many levels. One, it's going to improve your culture by including staff meals, but I worked front of house and our chef 
encouraged and insisted that we tried all the meals on the menu. So when customers asked us about them, we could give an honest review. Um, and people know when you're talking from the heart that you've actually tried the food as to whether or not you're just parroting what a chef has told you to say. Mm. And it, it's a way to sell your product by having your staff know exactly what it is, what it tastes like, where it comes from. I mean, I think we've all experienced that with a quality weight staff that knows their product. Mm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, what culture how should a small operator do you think communicate about culture you know because you know, intangible words like this are not easy for a lot of people to talk about they don't a lot of Aussie don't, Aussies don't talk about emotions um, too much do they but here we're talking in intangible terms aren't we oh look definitely and and the reality is that you know as James says you 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 need to have balance in the kitchen so, you know, there, there could be strong personalities, but there still needs to be. You can't have all strong personalities trying to work in a kitchen because nothing gets done. Mm -hmm. And you can't have all the creatives in the kitchen because everybody wants to be then, you know, challenging each other. So it's, it's working out what the actual requirement is for that kitchen. What's the best fit? Uh, you know, sometimes all you want is that humble person who's just going to be in the corner and just do everything they're told to exactly the same standard as what you require it to be. But it's it still comes down to what's in it for me. So from the from the the chef's point of view, when they go into a small place, they want to know that they're going to be looked after. You know, opportunity for training, opportunity for growth. Um, profit sharing is one of those words that I just don't like mm. uh, because it, it more often than not turns out to be worth nothing, and yet it's something that they can write on paper and dangle it like a you know mm. a little carrot out the front. So it's it's a bit of a red flag, I think, for some well, people. Well, it, it is. In my experience, it's never sort of it, it, it probably works, but I've, I've just not experienced it as working very mm. effectively. So, th and I know some small cafes put that in, and that's how they try and attract people. You know, they'll say, Oh, we're going to give them a profit share to try and get them involved in that sort of thing. But it, it does really just come down mm. to, you know, that the, the, the kitchen's happy, happy and supportive. And, and that's really mm. the culture that you're looking for. And, okay. And so a few simple words can that. communicate it by the sounds. Yeah. I think okay. so. Supportive is actually the biggest word. Mm. Hey, um, I know we've got a few um, students on here from William Anglis. Like, I know I know who you are, <laughs> but I really appreciate uh, all of you coming along to our webinars pretty regularly. I'm just uh, curious about your experience um, applying for jobs because I know you've probably got part-time time work and what sort of, uh, yeah, what your, what's resonated in ads um, when, you know, what was promised actually turned out to be true and that would be great if you could drop a few comments in the, in the chat. That would be really useful. Yeah, okay. Um, any other of the pointers there that we should, uh, you think that are not mentioned often enough? Paul, what about um, in rural areas? Um, what are some of the things there that you think should be um, mentioned more often or promised or part of the, well, the list of benefits? Well, the, the benefits are if you're trying to attract someone to a rural area, you're after a lifestyle, a lifestyle change. And there's, there's lots of chefs that don't want to be in Sydney or don't want to be in Melbourne or don't want to be in capital cities anymore and are more open to go into regional areas and bring their family and you know, go for a change of lifestyle. So assisting people with moving, uh, providing a subsidised or free rent for the first, you know, so many for a, for a certain period. I definitely know of places that offer rent included um, when, they, when they're trying to get chefs. And these are important things, but it's also to be mindful of when you're, when you're taking or getting chefs in, in regional areas, be very mindful about poaching. And I know that's something that sort of recruiters are very good at with their pipelines and people that they have everywhere. But when, when you're in a small place, if it happens to you, it's going to happen. It's going to happen to the other person and you're just going to keep stealing off each other continuously. Mm. So that's something to be very, very mindful of. Uh, and I certainly deal with people and who refuse to take people from other places that are their competition. 
especially if it's in one the same the same town um, up here on the northern rivers where you know it's, everything's a small place and they just know that if if they take from them someone's going to take from them exactly the same mm-hmm. and so it just goes round and round yeah okay well let's um move and talk about uh looking more widely for job candidates. Um, Paul, I might get you just to talk a little bit more, but you've been working up around Byron Bay and uh, Northern Rivers area and um, had a bit of success with some of those, you know, different types of campaigns. Tell us a bit about what you've been doing. Look, the various places are obviously offering things like, as I said before, it's life, lifestyle change, but also there's local produce, especially in regional areas. And a lot of chefs love to use local produce. And when you're in smaller places or smaller towns, the produce is so much closer to you. So food miles, all those sorts of things become Mm -hmm. really important. But also important is looking at what the actual person or the requirement of the job is. You know, there's there's a big cooking force out there called the mum force. And they're... they're Mum force. I like that. Mum force. They've they've been cooking forever. And sometimes that's the role that's required is that you don't need someone who's going to work 40 or 38 hours a week. Really all you're wanting someone for is 10 or 12 hours a week. And maybe you get three or four of them. And yes, that, that's not as good as having one person, uh-huh. but if it's all managed correctly and you're taking piecemeal to sort of you know, create your roster and, and make it work. That may be what's required, and it's certainly what's working in, in, in smaller areas and where there's less people to draw from is looking at what's the actual requirement of the job. Uh, it's fine to say, I want a chef, but maybe you don't need a chef. Maybe you just need someone who can do these activities and do them well and not bring their own sort of preconceived notions in there. So it can quite often work out a lot easier for you to run the kitchen and Mm -hmm. it's it's just looking at the the variables Uh, another big one is the school-based apprenticeships in that you've got kids that will make it part of their hsc and so for two years for two days a week and for more days a week during the school holidays you've got kids that are coming in and learning to cook and doing their apprenticeship at yes a slower pace but Apprentices, you know, the the main reason why there's a shortage of chefs is because there just hasn't been that pool of apprentices coming through over the last 10 or 15 years. Hotels traditionally were the the conduit for for apprentices and they've been not taking them for Mm. probably the last decade, Mm -hmm. less and less and less, outsourcing more of their products and things. And now we have this this thing where, you know, there's a shortage of chefs. We need to import them. Well, more important, I believe, is we need to grow them. And that's a positive language that all chefs need and hospitality needs to do as as a force is to be going out there and selling it in schools to the younger people, that it's a viable option, that chefing is a real career and there is lifestyle involved in Mm -hmm. it. And with all these variables that are around and flexibility, it can be it can be a, a very viable career, and I've been in it for over forty years. You know, I've, so I've had, Paul, I've the small <laughs> the small operators that um, Nikki sees a lot of might be saying, "Yeah, yeah, that's all very well, but you know, we're so tight here. We've only got six people. Um, can't afford the time off to even kind of." help a trainee or something like that how, how do we make this more accessible to to the little operators i mean to me um clubs and pubs should have an obligation to do that because they've got the money and the and the you know the the resources but well how, what's your advice for a small operator well they've always been the ones that have actually traditionally the smaller operators have been the ones that have, have sort of uh, used and abused apprentices in over the past Mm-hmm. because they've taken them in as kitchen hands and taken them in as cheap labour. Right. So it's not something that small operators haven't done in the past. Uh, they just have to be smarter about the way they use and train. Yeah. And, okay. and to, you know, like to, to say that they can't afford to, well, it's like, what, what are your options? Mm-hmm. Like you have to be flexible and you have to be more creative in, in what you're using to sure. fill your workforce. 
Hey, James, what about um, being one of those people, older workers? What, what are you what are you seeing in the market? You know, because um, people in the kind of 40, 50 age group are pretty vocal about the fact they feel left out and overlooked. Um, it's a huge workforce, but others will say not as flexible, not as available, don't move quickly enough. What's your, what's your observations? That is a bit of a hand grenade of a question. <laughs> um, You're a big, strong I mean, guy. <laughs> I think that's a really difficult question to answer. Um, it, it varies massively from business to business. Um, I, I obviously can't mention any clients' names, but age is definitely something that comes up in the in the brief taking conversation, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if it's a front of house role, um, and, and and it does vary from front of house to back of house. To be fair, um, I think my perception might be slightly skewed <clears throat> because I tend to work with slightly bigger organisations. Um, I don't tend to work with the smaller businesses. I suppose purely as a function of cost and they maybe don't need the support that bigger businesses do. Um, but I suppose on the flip side of it, it's not like I'm seeing an increase in, in older workers that aren't being recruited now. Um, I don't think there's a higher ratio of older workers who aren't getting work from, from what I can see. Um, but there's definitely a lot of skill and a lot of talent there. It's just, I suppose, as Paul was saying, it's about being creative with, you know, the, with what's available to you. It's one thing mm -hmm. having a picture in your mind of what you want, but if you can't have that, then you've got to find another way. And um, I think, you know, if there's someone talented, you know, motivated uh, and capable of performing what you need them to perform in your restaurant, then I don't think age should be a barrier to that. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a bit of a, something that people don't talk about a lot, but uh, yeah, interesting Paul, Paul, have you had success? Well, you know, well, I'm I'm interested in the mum force, and they're probably a lot of those people in the thirty plus age group. Uh, any oh, yeah. other... M moving around, I've actually come come across quite a quite a number of chefs who are even older than me. Uh, hands on, uh, quite often they're they've been out of the out of they've been semi retired as executive chefs from you know years gone by. They're in their mm -hmm. late sixties, early seventies, and they're they're, they love being in a kitchen and all they really want is like four or eight hours a week. And, you know, perfect for Friday night, Saturday or Sunday, Saturday, okay. Sunday, those sorts of things. And there's definitely lots of older workers out there who are keen just to do a little bit of work. Mm, okay. Because, Interesting. You know, sitting around all day. Bit of a roster not, nightmare, not but that might be all we could do. <laughs> well, it's the, the, using that experience is actually extremely good. Yeah, yeah, okay. And having a lot of people that are flexible on the hours is also really handy. When I used to do rosters, I'd give all new staff members three highlighters. Highlight green, the ones you really want to work. Yellow, the ones who are available but would prefer not to. And red, things that you absolutely can't work because people have commitments. Um, and I found that I had never any problem because some people wanted to work Sunday for the extra money, whereas others didn't because they had other commitments. Mm. 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 Interesting. Okay, let's jump on to our next uh, one about pay and conditions. Um, James, can you give us some guidance on, you know, how pay rates have increased? You know, there is an award rate that we all know about. Um, what's your, let's, let's talk about kitchen staff. Okay. Yeah, I have seen um, a massive increase in salary demands um, massive is the word you used there i noticed yeah, yeah it is, okay. it's been quite significant i i, I um actually I, for a while i was calling it the crown casino effect um that they were you know they were opening um or planning to open their casino you know as this sort of shortage was really manifesting itself and um you know they're opening some you know massive budget huge operations high quality and they basically um you know were, were eating up all of the talent in sydney um and as a result um you know they were advertising um you know 75 plus super for a cdp um you know and that's you know that's a that's a good salary for a, for a sous chef 18 months ago um and all of a sudden, you know, CDP see that and every CDP wants, wants 75K. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have seen a big increase in, 
in what the candidates are expecting. Um, so I, I suppose the way that I'm advising my clients to, to advertise at the moment is, is not to put the salary on the advert. Um, so certainly when I'm speaking to chefs, I won't put 75 on, um, on a CDP advert uh, because everyone wants 75. And as soon as you ask them what they're on, it's 75K. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so what I'll do is on the, on the seek sal- salary banding, um, which the candidates can't see, but for search functions, it'll show them jo- jobs within that range. I'll put 65 to whatever the max is, 80, I think it is. Um, but I won't put the actual... Um, salary level on the advert so they won't know and then as part of my first stage screen i'll ask them specifically what's your current salary level um and that way you get a far truer reflection of of where they are and what their expectation is right okay um, good so, uh, interview what, yeah. what does cdp stand for sorry chef de party so it's like a it's like a sort of second or third level up in the kitchen okay cool thanks it's like the, the engine room they do they do all the they do a lot of the hard work. The mm. workers. The, yeah. workers. <laughs> the, the ones who do the real work. Okay. Yeah. Um, interesting. Any, and any questions um, people listening in have got? Um, James is the man with his finger on the pulse for all this. What about conditions? How have conditions changed, James, or expectations and what's being offered? Well, I, th- I think there's a couple of things at play there. One, people are having to get more and more competitive with what they're offering to attract people. Um, and two, um, it's been well documented, well publicised. Fair work have been cracking down over the last three or four years on businesses for, you know, making chefs, you know, flogging chefs, basically making them work 60 hours a week. Particularly those on visas have been particularly Um, I guess, affected by this. Um, And there's been a couple of big um, court cases. Fair Work took Rockpool Dining to court. I think they were fined about six million bucks in in back pay and labelled a wage theft. Um, uh, QT Hotels also got a couple of million fine. Merivale are being investigated at the moment. I'm not sure if it's come to an end, but they certainly were being looked at by by Fair Work. George Colombaris very publicly was disgraced as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, one employers are seeing that and realizing they can't necessarily get away with what they used to get away with um, and two uh, a lot of the chefs in the market know this have seen it and have seen people get back pay and know people who work for those businesses so that they're really hot on their rights now mm-hmm. um, so I think businesses are having to learn how to you know work with you know, a full-time, full-time or plus reasonable overtime. So, you know, it's, it's actually getting more and more uncommon to find chefs being expected to work more than 45 hours without overtime now. Mm, um, interesting. More, yeah. Whereas three or four years ago, like 60 hours was common and that's it, like it'll lump it. Well, interesting to see um, in the chef, some of the chef forums on Facebook, um, people innocently put up ads with, you know, seriously kind of <laughs> low salaries and that. Absolutely slammed by you know the court of public opinion there, yeah. uh, as they usually should be. They're <laughs> pretty dumb. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's um, let's and anyone who's got questions for James, so uh, invitations there. Drop them into the chat. Um, processing applicants, James. When we talked before, you mentioned how a lot of people seem to take a long time to kind of move. But your process. Just tell us about. You know how you respond from the minute, say, an email drops in from a seek ad or something like that. What? How do you? Yeah. Move? So I, I I use like a, a candidate aggregating system, um, and essentially it's like a CRM system, but for recruitment. So I, I actually write and create all my advertising within that CRM system. Um, I then press a button and it gets posted out to whichever job boards I choose. I've got about nine or ten that I use. One I pay for. The rest are free job boards, like Indeed and Jora and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of my applications come into one place. Um, I've got various response templates all set up, ranging from your application looks great. I've tried to call. I can't reach you. I'd love to chat. Please ring me back to thanks for thanks for replying, but it's, it's not quite right this time. I'll give you a call down the track if something more suitable comes along. But uh-huh. my, But generally, every morning before I do anything else, I try and respond um, or process every application I've got in. Because if you see a rock star and that rock star is in the market and in your inbox, I can guarantee you they're in about 10 other people's inbox. 
And if you don't move on it, they, they're gone. So I, I speak to a lot of candidates, clients, and oh yeah, I've got, I've got this application from this chef. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's all right. Don't worry. You know, we've got this covered. <laughs> Might get them in for a trial next week or something yeah. like that. <laughs> call them, call them a week later, and then they're surprised that, 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 that you know they've got a job. Uh, like it's a candidate short market. You, you've got to move like if you see someone good you've got to move um you know you're not holding all the all the, all the aces in the pack you know you've got to you've got to engage with people you've got to talk to them um you've got to get them in you've got to get them interested and and as i said earlier you know it's it, it, they might not be right at that time they might not be ready to leave it might not be quite right quite the right job but if that's a good candidate for your business they're culturally aligned they're talented keep the conversation going you know and, and in six months you might have the perfect job for them um, right. And that's where uh, I guess my processes really help businesses because then you're strategically pipelining talent rather than reactive advertising, which is what 90% of businesses do. Um, and if you do that, all you're getting is the person that applies and not the best person mm. for the business. So you've actually put a course together, haven't you, to teach people how to kind of manage this whole recruitment process. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about what's involved with the course. So that it's about how to attract, recruit and retain the best talent for your business. And, and the whole philosophy of it is that recruitment isn't something you do on Thursday because you need someone on Friday. Like if that's your mentality, I hate to say it, but you've already lost. <laughs> like mm-hmm. You're going to need to call me and get me to recruit for you if that's how you're recruiting. Um, so it's about setting up systems like you know, the, 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 the candidate aggregating system, the CRM system I was talking about just a minute ago. It's about teaching people how to build a talent acquisition strategy that's constant, that's constantly rolling. So you know what the key roles are in your business. You know where the, where the pressure points are. You're constantly looking for those people. Mm. Um, you're constantly pipeline. You're constantly talking to them. So when that gap opens up, you know, you've already got seven or eight phone numbers um, and, and you know the right people to call and get into your business mm, um i like it and mm. it, it's about yeah it's about teaching people that it's it's a it's a strategy it's not just banging up an advert and yeah. hoping for the best mm. nikki i might get you to drop that uh, james's details in the chat again because he's yep. on his uh page there he's got details about the course um let's jump on to a little bit more detail about you know if you use an outsider and a lot of people want to just valiantly soldier on all by themselves and they feel they can't afford to get expertise um what's the value pool of getting someone like you along or another consultant what do you do that people can't do themselves well i can point them in the direction of what their what their requirements really are but Mm -hmm. there's I mean, for some people, there's there are there are web-based uh, application HR slash sort of systems out there whereby they're constantly looking. Like the the job board is up there. It's got it funnels into a into a website. The website is 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 separating what the requirements are from the job from the from the form that they're filled out. And, and then they have that pipeline in that business constantly mm-hmm. of people that are looking for those sort of particular things. Uh, and, and there's definitely, there's definitely organisations out there that I, I know that do it and businesses haven't found themselves looking because there's a constant queue of people waiting to get into that particular business. And, mm-hmm. yes, there's a cost associated with having that continually running, but it really depends. You know, I'm talking about businesses that have over 100 staff uh, and so these things make it, you know, make a lot of sense. Sure. I guess your job is to come in and clean them up sometimes so that they're presentable for, <laughs> <laughs> there might be a large organisation run, you know, poorly and uh, that's why they've got high start turnover. What about, uh, James, just tell us a bit more about, if people are not so clear about it, what a recruiter does, say I'm a restaurant or a large cafe, how would you kind of take over something that I'm stressing out about? So if, I, if you ask me, so I guess I offer two services. One is, is recruitment, so I'll actually do it for you. Um, the other service is the course, which we just touched on. But if a recruiter, if I recruit for you, you're accessing the best candidate available in the market rather than the best one that applies to that one ad. And I suppose the best way to understand that is mm-hmm. only 20% of candidates who are open to moving jobs are actively looking at any one time. Mm-hmm. So if you put your ad up, you're, you're actually only appealing to 20% of the market and it's probably only a percentage of that 20% that happens to be on seek that day um, whereas the way that I recruit 
Um, yes, I advertise all roles, but um, I'm continuously pipelining talent, as we talked about a moment ago. So, you know, I'm, I'm headhunting, um, I'm networking, um, I'm filing, you know, I'm screwing people away into folders. Um, you know, I've got folders for sous chefs, CDPs, restaurant managers. Um, so when a client calls me and says, James, I really need a hand, um, like I'm going to very quickly be able to go through my database, go through all the paid for databases, run an advertising campaign, and then present a suitable shortlist of candidates who are qualified for the role. Um, so you can pick the best one that's available rather than just John because he applied on Thursday. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah. Um, Nikki, you got any observations on consultants or recruiters? Have you sort of come across um, clients who have been using Mm, no, I haven't really got a lot of experience, not with the recruitment side. Consultants, definitely. I've um, had clients that have worked with Paul um, directly and also a couple of other consultants that we work, mm-hmm. we work with. Um, I do think it's beneficial uh, for both startup and long-term businesses to, to get outside in, input because sometimes when you're in the eye of the storm, you don't really see where you can improve um, and it's always important to look for improvements it, it's not just about retaining staff it's about saving money sure james um poaching are you do you poach or do you i, I was interested you said 20 percent of people and who are open to moving or sort of interested in moving um but not actively looking i, I like the distinction you drew there but Paul was kind of a bit savage about poaching before. Are you guys on opposite sides here, or? Well, I mean, it's, some... it's what it's it's what I do. Like I, mm-hmm. I, I, I connect talent that's interested in moving with culturally aligned businesses looking for that skill set. That's what sure. I do. And, yeah. and if that person is open to having a conversation, then then I will introduce them. And I'm, you know, that that's that's the way the world works. But I would never. I would never submit a resume of someone who didn't want to have a conversation or wasn't open to it. Mm, so sure. I suppose I'd like to make the point that it's always the candidates, it's always the candidates' decision whether or not they get poached or they get put put forward for a role. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I have have clients well all over Australia that will, you know, what one of the questions I ask them is what businesses do you aspire to be like? Where do you like to hire people from? And I, I will target those companies. Um mm. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. Answer that question. Good yeah. point. Okay. Um, speedy induction. Paul, you uh, had a few comments when I was talking to you recently about that. You know, getting people up to speed quickly and um, you know feeling part of the part of the business that they've joined. Yeah. Look, and all you you have to have something an onboarding system that actually is effective. Uh, staff who come in when they're new. They're unsure of themselves, and you know if there's not if there's not the, to get just thrown straight into it is not the most conducive way to keep a staff member. Uh, they have to feel part of the team. So buddy systems, clear goals, clear roles. Um, there has to be something where you know it's not a, a twenty minute thing where you you know this is it, induction's done, get in, do it, and start doing your job. So it's very important that that you, you work out what that, um, that onboarding looks like and that it does cover off on all the areas that you say that the people need to have. So if you say they've got to have a food handle certificate or it says that they've got to have a certain qualification or they've got to have certain skills, then make sure that they actually do. And if not, what training are you going to give? So everything needs to be fairly clear. And I definitely see people just... Businesses are so busy, just get in there and start doing it. And I've even watched them. You know, I've watched casual chefs come in and not know what to do for three hours. And I've just, I shake my head and I go, I don't even know what they're doing here. So it's it's important that that you are very clear in what you're providing for that new staff member. With your, James, with your kind of, your A-grade clients, let's call them that, you know, businesses that um, you know will do a great job with new hires, what what are some of the elements of that? What makes their induction system good? I think I think what Paul Paul said is absolutely right, just making it abundantly clear what, what the expectation is um, and also making sure, I know we've said the word before, 
but culture is important. So induct them into that as well. Make sure they feel part of the crew. Mm -hmm. um, make them feel welcome. Um, you know, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen chefs, you know, and restaurant managers on their first day, you know, be put in charge of of the restaurant on a Friday night. You know, that that is not a smart thing to do. <laughs> um, like if it's going to blow up, if you're going to break it, that's how you break it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, you know, and then the client rings me up and asks why they didn't work out. And it's like, well, kind of shoot yourself in the foot there, mate. Um, but I think that, you know, I've got one client in particular in Melbourne that's got um, probably about 70 restaurants and they are amazing at onboarding. Uh, they've got a full six week training program for their managers so they go wow. through all the stations they learn how to 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 run the till they learn how to run the floor they learn how to run food they learn actually how to be um because it's a it's a casual dining restaurant there's nothing too taxing they learn how to be a grill chef they learn about stock rotation they learn about ordering they learn how to manage cost of goods they learn how to do the end of week banking from a manager perspective they learn how to write rosters and it all gets signed off um, and they don't actually do their first shift in charge of the restaurant until they've completed that. Mm -hmm. um, and their staff retention is fantastic. You know, yeah, it must be a pleasure life. for you to recruit for them too. I love working you, for them, yeah. Because you know yeah. that you can promise something that's real quality is it, in the way of a 100%, job. 100%, yeah. And it's yeah. such a good sell to the candidates as well. And mm -hmm. like, I've had such good feedback from the candidates I've placed in that business. I can genuinely talk about it to, to the candidates I'm recruiting. Yeah. Um, and I think that really comes through. So um, I think... Yeah, that's, I suppose that's a really good example. But I mean, mm. you know, it's not free. You have to, you know, you have to invest in it. Um, but I suppose that the longer term benefit is you're going to have engaged, capable employees and you're not going to have to do this constant hamster wheel of recruitment, retraining, yeah. recruitment, yeah. retraining. Mm. Okay, so just wrapping up, we've just got a few more minutes. Um, and I think we've talked around this topic of culture um, and being employer of choice from lots of different angles already. But I just wondered if there's uh, any other pointers you, Paul, there you are with some pictures I grabbed from your LinkedIn. And I really <laughs> like the way you, uh, yeah, you, you, you're very proud of your work and you're very proud of the work you've done with trainees and you've uh, always taken a selfie there, which I like. So, yeah, what, what is, is there any other things that we haven't mentioned so far about maintaining a productive culture and becoming you know the place that everyone wants to work well it's 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 ensuring that this you're holding the staff up i mean that's something that i've always tried to do for my whole career is you know whilst whilst it's nice to be the person in charge and get all the accolades and that's naturally what happens it's still extremely important to make sure that the people that are, are doing the work right down to the lowest one that you're you're holding them up, that you're letting them know that their their role and their job and their performance is not only acceptable. It's you know it's so necessary. Uh, kitchen hands is you know the the ones that are sitting there underneath the pile of rubbish, you know, and mm. and, and quite often forgotten, and then they they're going home after everybody else has left, and you know some feel no appreciation. Uh, they're they're absolutely key looking after that sort of, you know, the further down the, the line, the more important they are as far as I'm concerned. Mm. And, and mm. that's the culture. That's, that's, that's what you teach your leaders and your head chefs or your sous chefs. That's what you teach them to do too. So, and, and knowing that it's not about going in and just blowing people up, you know, knowing how to, how to communicate when there is a problem. You know, the, the negative is quite often 1% or 2%. And yet, if you go into most places, you'd swear it was, you know, 100% of the whole problem. Hey, the James, way that everybody you, responds. Yeah, James, can you teach people, teach leaders to be kind of better leaders, you know, to understand this culture word or do they have to be kind of born with it or what, what's your thoughts? How do we improve our kitchen leaders or our restaurant leaders? Yeah, look, I think, I mean, part of leadership is innate. You, you know, some, some leaders are that real, you know, alpha type personality but I definitely think that a lot of leadership is a skill you know um, learning how to communicate effectively learning how to to um, hold people accountable learning how to have difficult conversations you know you, you might have a really good point and it might be really valid but if, you, if you're confronting in the way you approach it sometimes it does more harm than good mm. so learning how to manage those situations um, so absolutely I think that um, leadership is something that can be taught and um you know 
I think ongoing training or um, but I suppose it comes back to the humble word we used it earlier but mm. you know if, if someone's humble yeah. enough to to be able to take feedback on their leadership that's that's the sort of character you want to be recruiting mm. yeah I'm going to keep thinking about that word I like it more and more <laughs> okay well look we're wrapping up now um, just uh, like to thank our uh, guests very much and thank everyone who's come along today just um wouldn't mind a quick tip from each of you about how to, you know, be more successful in a, a time of dramatic staff shortages. Paul, what's your the the key your... is retention, totally retention. Okay, um, we don't actually need to recruit because we don't lose people. Well, <laughs> the, if you have retention, you actually become an employer of choice. If you're an employer of choice, people will contact you, and that's a situation I've been involved in for, for decades. Yeah. where people, where chefs or other staff would contact me and want to come and work for me. 